everybody. Welcome to the Tech Raptor Podcast. I'm Robert Scrapanito, your features editor. Outridge Dogette, site founder. Andrew Stritch, console editor. Console editor. You are editing all the consoles? Yep. It's been a big week for console editing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some deletions, some additions. Yep. There's a lot going on. Oh, there is a lot going on because we're going to talk about in the news segment, all three of the major console players. Uh, and, and in the game segment, we're going to talk about Ravenlock, one of the new releases on Xbox Game Pass, as well as Star Wars Jedi Survivor, including spoilers, which we will save at the end and we will flag them. So you will know if you haven't finished the game yet to hop off and not listen to the spoilers until you finish the game. Then you can come back, hear our thoughts on it. But we'll let's... You. We will miss you, but, you know, may the force be with you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, with your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> uh, let's jump into Sony. They have shut down their first party studio, Pixel Opus, who you might know from creating that one game, Concrete Genie, uh, back in 2019. Yeah. And also a game called Entwined from almost 10 years ago now, back in 2014. Um, this was revealed when Pixel Opus posted on, I believe, Twitter. Dear friends, our Pixel Opus adventure has come to an end. As we look to new futures, we wanted to say a heartfelt thank you to the millions of passionate players who have supported us and our mission to make beautiful, imaginative games with heart. We are so grateful. Uh, this comes right off the heels of Sony just acquiring Firewalk Studios not too long ago, right? And then I think the, the day we're recording the podcast, I mean, there's rumors going around that Sony is in exclusive deals to lock down some stuff from Konami. Who knows if that's true? But, you know, this is kind of just a come and go, give and take kind of situation run right now with Sony. It's it's very strange in like the the how much growth is happening, but also how much shedding we're seeing around the industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it looks like uh, Pixel Opus was working on a new game. Um, so, you know, and... You know, we did some looking around and couldn't t find too much about that. But you'd have to think if Concrete Genie shipped in 2019, um, then, you know, now four years later, they probably weren't too far away from getting the point of, like, showing it unless there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on behind the scenes that will likely never see the light of day. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and I think this is uh, the second studio Sony has shut down in two years, right? Because I think in mm -hmm. 2021, they shut down Japan studio, Sony Japan, Japan studio, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so there is definitely a bit of shedding going on amid all of their slow growth to run the acquisitions these, and all. These have also, I think, <laughs> Sony Japan more than, than Pixel Opus, but those are also two of the studios that were kind of doing more of the non-traditional like the the non-blockbustery stuff mm -hmm. um that we're now so used to seeing out of sony mm -hmm. um which is a real shame the things that aren't quite as in line with sony's kind of north star you might say yeah yeah, yeah live yeah, service yeah. games is that is that the north star yes that is yep ghost of tsushima famously all about the loot boxes <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it, is, it does seem like Sony is trying to like focus down on what they do best, which I mean, is not a bad strategy necessarily, right? Like, I mean, if you look at their first party roster, it's probably what is selling PS5s at the rate that oh, they're yeah. selling them, right? Like everyone wants to see what God of War is about. Everyone wants to see what this HBO show was like before it was a show. Um, so I mean, it's kind of hard to blame them for focusing down on yes. what it is best for them. But it is still sad for the people who work at Pixel Opus, who now are out of a job. Or or for the people who don't want, who don't always want the gritty AAA blockbuster that want the series about, you know, kids going through time recapturing monkeys or um, Gravity Rush or Concrete Genie. Um, you know, I think kind for of, a kind second of... about that first example. Right, right. Escape. Escape. Yeah. yeah, which was which was part of Japan Studio, mm -hmm. um, yeah, classic spinoff of Metal Gear Solid Three: Snake Eater. Oh, that was <laughs> such a good mini game, Measle Gear Solid. <laughs> God, so fucking good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think we're just not going to see these smaller things come out of Sony first party as much. Maybe, um, 
which is an interesting and different strategy than what Xbox is doing, right? Because Xbox is kind of all about, I mean, Game Pass, right? It's like probably one of the best movers of indie games. Oh, yeah. um, but then even their big studios, they're, they're pushing out games like Hi-Fi Rush, right? That aren't quite the big AAA blockbuster thing, but more, you know, here's a tight, smaller experience. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's Xbox like... has been more indie focused for a lot longer than anyone else. I think like you look back at, you know, Xbox 360, you had Xbox Arcade, which was usually mm-hmm. pretty small games, <laughs> um, things that probably would not have seen the light. Otherwise, you see ID at Xbox, which is a big kind of game promotion wing. Um, and then you're seeing a lot of smaller games end up on Games Pass to hit kind of a broader audience. Like I think one of the favorite ones I have that ended up on Games Pass was RoboQuest, mm-hmm. um, which is just a really enjoyable kind of um, roguelike shooter that had decent traction on Steam. But from what I understand, when it went over to Xbox Games Pass, like it bl- did really well. Right. And so it's really good to continue to see games that deserve some attention get that attention through the platform. And I wish that... Sony did that a little bit more. Mm. Um, you know, I think they've got a good install base and there's a lot of opportunity for indies to thrive there as well. Agreed. Well, I think part of it too is it's interesting to see the strategy come from them where, because we also know, right, that for years now, Sony's been trying to push uh, more live service, right? They, there was that one one mm-hmm. time where they were like, we have 14 live service projects <laughs> in the work or some shit. Um, and active, like if this were Activision, They'd be like, well, bye-bye Vicarious Visions, but all of you shift over to work on Call of Duty, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas here, Sony, it doesn't seem like they're doing that as as far as my understanding of the story goes. It's not like the people at Pixel Opus are now working on some unannounced Sony live service game, right? Yeah. That's not the... That's definitely not the vibe that that the announcement gave out. It definitely gave a, like, goodbye, we are gone you know, mm-hmm. see us pop up elsewhere. Yeah. Kind of, kind of situation. Exactly. Um, now let's shift over and talk about Xbox. Uh, there's been a lot of Xbox news uh, this past week because Phil Spencer, head of Xbox, went on the kind of funny X cast uh, to kind of, kind of get grilled honestly it was a little, um, I mean, it's been a rough week for Xbox, right? Uh, so it kind of makes sense for, you know, there, there's this opportunity, right, for Snowbike Mike and Gary Witta and Paris Lilly to ask all these questions, these harder questions than you might expect. Um, definitely still have a nice slant. I mean, they are the Xbox podcast, right? Like, of course, you're going to be kind of nice about it. Was, it. It, was like a, it was like a, none of us want to be here doing this, but like we would be doing a disservice to the listeners if we did not ask these hard questions. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but boy, so. I think what the podcast came out on Monday, and I think that the rest of the week I was seeing nothing but um, but repurposed pull quotes from it, um, mm-hmm. fueling fueling everyone's clicks. <laughs> and if you would like to yep. see some of those repurposed pull quotes, you can go to techraptor.net slash news. Yeah, no, like <laughs> we're guilty of it. We're talking about it today. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, I don't know, maybe the fir- the biggest one to me is the, uh, I mean, this is kind of like a, a non-news, but still news because it came out of Phil's mouth on a live stream, but mm-hmm. that they're disappointed by the UK's uh, CMA's decision about saying no to the acquisition of Activision Blizzard King, but they will appeal it, which, you know, I mean, not unexpected, right? Of course, yeah. you're going to want to appeal yeah, they've that. Already, they've already said as much, um, mm-hmm. you know, it'll just mean that we'll get to keep talking about major acquisitions in the industry yeah you know they may not be a monopoly yet but they've definitely monopolized the gaming news space because that's (laughs) all anyone talks about (laughs) right yeah that was just the whole week like everybody just fighting over what he did and didn't say and yeah it's been it's been a lot Mm -hmm. to me the most interesting quote that came out of all of that was phil really like highlighting that to have lost the Xbox One PS4 generation 
was the worst generation that they could have lost because of the establishment of digital libraries. That thanks, Dom Matrick. Well, I mean, yeah and no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was just very, very crazy to think because yeah, that had been something that I personally had not really thought of too much. Is that like, yeah, every single time, like from now on. Chances are when, you know, you buy your PlayStation 7, your PlayStation 9, you're, you're going to be coming into it with some level of install base um, as, but as you know. I, I thought Sony believed in generations. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think even if there is only one generation back, like, like Sony came into the PS5 generation with saying like, okay, we're going to do support for ps4 disc games and playstation 5 games and then they've been you know dragged kicking and screaming over some proverbial line to offer more backwards compatible stuff um but yeah and i think that that's kind of you know it's an extra strength to game pass to be like this is our impressive library you can pay ten dollars a month and look you're now invested in the in the ecosystem Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it is it is definitely weird to think like going from a super nintendo to a nintendo 64 or a playstation one it's like well it doesn't it didn't matter like you don't even really know what's going to be coming out you know unless you're you're reading from uh gaming magazines so it's just a you know where are you going to go what are you going to do um yeah yeah and now it's like you've got that investment yeah, and I thought that was an interesting point. I agree that I didn't think about how the digital space kind of affects generations like that. And I wonder if part of that part of that is just our privilege, right? As like we get free codes every now and then, like to do work with it. But you know, we don't have to think as much about like where do we per- where do we have to like be where is our home console, right? You know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wonder if that's something we maybe oversee just based on the gig that we have, right? Um, but I do think that there's there's a point to that, right? Where you can bet your bottom dollar that when we get to the PS7 and the Xbox Series Epsilon, at some point, they're going to be all digital. Like, there's not going to be a disk drive anymore, right? I, I don't yeah. know if that's the next generation or the generation after or I mean, beyond. It, but. Going, going by what patents Sony has and, you know, everyone claiming that you know whatever the playstation 5 pro is is 100 percent in production it's almost looking like the this playstation 5 pro is going to be digital only and you can also get an external hard drive uh, an mm-hmm. external disk drive mm-hmm. um if you want to and i mean that's that's interesting yeah um but i mean you know and people might look at that and lament the fact that you don't have a disk drive um but like most laptops, most computers, you know, you go out of your way if you want a CD drive or a Blu-ray drive. Um, I had been given a, a CD for something a few years ago. I was like, oh, cool. And I had to like do a double take and think like, what can I even run this on in my house? And it was like the only disk drive I have that is actively working is my Series X. But if they had offered a digital only Series X, I would have bought that instead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same. I mean, do you have a record player? You can put the CD on it upside down and let the needle kind of it's, if it if it hadn't <laughs> been for if it hadn't been for the Xbox, if I wanted to listen to that CD, I would have had to have pulled out my PS2. Mm. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I think for me the most accessible like i mean i have the ps5 and xbox with the disk drive but if i didn't have those it'd be my car like that's the next cd drive that i have <laughs> you know? about my car <laughs> yeah yeah your xbox series car um, my car doesn't even have a cd drive anymore really? wow. yeah. like my my car you know i've got i've got like a little automatic wireless charging thing that grabs my phone and i have an echo auto in my car no um, cd the, uh, I mean, it, it, but it, it, you know, it's a separate device, but, you know, if I sit down in my car and I want to listen to music, I just announce, you know, echo play this song. Right. Like it didn't even, I don't even fuck with the dials. It's like twice a year I get to refumble 
and figure out how to change it for daylight savings. <laughs> and like, <laughs> that is all I touch my dash for. Wow. Yeah. That is kind of crazy. Well, with uh, going back to like the consoles, right? I think digital is like kind of the big future. And that kind of mm -hmm. ties into, I think one of the last things Phil said in the interview is that they're not in the business of quote unquote out consoling uh, Sony or Nintendo which makes a lot of sense, right? Which, which again, like if we're going into a digital future and we know Xbox is trying to do the like play anywhere thing, very literally like stretch, you just bought a TV with an Xbox yeah. inside kind of, right? <laughs> so yeah, it was weird. Uh, yeah, I got one of the, the Samsung TVs that has like game streaming built in. I still have yet to like sit down and try it to, to see how well it works. Right. But it was like, even then, like I plugged the Xbox in and the TV knew it was an xbox it was connected to changed the input to xbox series x and even put the xbox series x logo on that hdmi input wow, um nice. and it's like games <laughs> play games <laughs> yeah but i think that's the future we're moving to that's the future xbox wants right is that you mm -hmm. can pull out your phone your tablet the tv already has the xbox app in it like X the future of xbox isn't a machine it's an app right mm -hmm. i think it's both. Um, well, yeah, it, 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 it is, be yeah. yeah. I think I think that's the slant we're going to see over the coming years. We're going to move away from physical and all of the ramifications that come with that in terms of game preservation. Um, but the direction of of gaming, I think, is also kind of the heading the same way of 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 work in terms of it doesn't really matter where you are or what you're using, you can play. Um, mm -hmm. You know, PC, for example, you know, you had the Steam Deck release and that picked up traction quickly. And now we're starting to see other companies building newer and better versions of that, which allow you to play your games anywhere. You know, I think the one thing I remember early on with Xbox Games Pass was when Final Fantasy 15 came to it. I could play either on my computer or on my Xbox and it would just transfer the save. Right. Um, mm -hmm. which to me was a nice thing. Like, all right, I'm playing 15 in the living room. All right. Wife wants to watch something on the TV. I just come in here and play it on my, on my desktop. Like mm -hmm. it offers a significant amount of versatility and for Xbox, it doesn't need a console to work. Like, and that was, that was something that we saw. We saw Xbox use as a major selling point. Like this will be an Xbox play anywhere title. And a lot of people were like, oh, okay, whatever, Xbox Play Anywhere, it's marketing. And then we had like all of the issues with um, Spider-Man, uh, Marvel Spider-Man and the cross save situation. And that if you were playing on a PS4 and then you moved to a PS5, you could initiate like a one-time save transfer that would convert the PS4 save into a PS5 save, but then they would be like two independent things. It's not like it would like sync back for you. Right. Um, yeah. It was very, very weird. Yeah. Whereas um, Xbox, they're, they're, they acquired Todd Howard just for this, that you can just say it just works. Right. Yeah. Like for Xbox, we trademarked just... it. So yeah. that was really the whole purpose behind the, the right. acquisition there is that they wanted to just be able to say it works. Yes. Um, but let's talk about that elephant in the room, right? The Zenimax elephant in the room of Redfall, um, oh, which boy. has been uh, a, a blemish on Xbox's prestigious uh, record of first party studios, first party games. Um, so it came out. I don't know if you've seen reviews because it's kind of old news by now, by the time you're listening to this, but Redfall apparently isn't that great. It is at best mediocre. It's at worst a technical mess. Depends who you ask, but I think you'd be hard pressed to find people who are genuinely like, this is the greatest game ever made. Uh, and Phil Spencer is aware of this. Uh, he has said in the interview that they did internal play testings and internal review scores were double digits higher than like the Metacritic open critic scores. Right. Which is interesting to see. Um, but he apologized for the game, said that it's a huge disappointment whenever they disappoint the gamers. And uh, he's still committed to 60 FPS eventually for Redfall and to continue to work on it to make it better. Yeah, I mean, looking at my Xbox app on my PC, it has a 1.7. Um, 
review Stars. score and oh. people just saying i can't even launch it mm. um huge miss just yep massive I mean, Stretch is our resident. We joke about it a lot about him being our resident, like Game Pass show. But even you were like, "No, nah, I'm good." <laughs> yeah, I like it. It had been on, it had been on my radar to at least check out to to play some of, um, and it's just been a thing that has not like it has not filtered high enough on my like, oh, I I need to get to this, to even pull up and check out. Um, you know, realistically, that might be something that I check out through like the the game streaming on my TV when I do, just to like see what this is like. Um, but you know, like I've I've been I've been replaying uh, Breath of the Wild instead, um, and like trying to relearn those janky controls, um, because that's just like that is that is more interesting to me to replay the game that I have one hundred percent completed. Um, than than to check out whatever is going on with Redfall. <laughs> mm. So I have checked it out because I felt like if we were going to talk about it on the show, I should at least have some first party or first hand knowledge of it. And it's mm. basically free because I have Game Pass and all games on Game Pass are free. <laughs> um, man, it is it is rough. I feel bad for the internal reviewers who did who said it was good. I don't know where they're like either they're the nicest yes men in the world in which case they should not be internal reviewers for your game mm -hmm. or they're oblivious which also they shouldn't really be internal reviewers for your game or you know maybe there's like some sort of um hierarchy problem you know like because like phil's at the top who knows how many layers of you know mm -hmm. vice president managers are under him right and maybe just the messages aren't getting filtered through Either way, Redfall, I think, does not make a strong first impression. I think there is something about it that will stick out to you from the start. Uh, my mm -hmm. first uh, sign that I was in for a wild ride is I installed it on my PC, booted it up to play it, and I said, oh, we have an update to install. And it reinstalled the entire ass game. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and it is... Like it, it is just uh, rough. It looks like a 360. It looks like Left 4 Dead 2, honestly, which... Left 4 Dead 2 is a fine game, but mm -hmm. graphically, you know, it's definitely not quite the cutting edge in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, when you sprint, you truly feel like a camera floating forward, not a human mm -hmm. being bipedal running, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. The guns feel weak, and the reloads are slow, and the aiming is something off about it. Powers are underwhelming. Like, overall, it is just a... It is surprising that Xbox would release it in the state it is in also just not what we've come to expect from arcane yes. it's very uncharacteristic and i mean confusing I, I having a game launch in this state is just incredibly surprising like there yeah. should be enough internal kind of checks and balances the <laughs> internal reviewers to begin with um that prevent something like this but i don't know if it was we have to hit this deadline and just ship it like we've seen a lot in the last couple of years or if you know they really were oblivious to kind of the flaws of the game and to them it seemed good mm. um it's just very strange yeah it definitely felt like a game cosplaying as an arcane game which feels pretty weird <laughs> considering it, it is an arcane game because there are bits and pieces that are like here are some notes scattered around to like so you can mm -hmm. kind of immerse yourself in the world a bit more but mm -hmm. then you know you have your three other friends who are running around and doing their own immersive thing and like every time they find a note it, sh it tells you you found a note do you want to read it so it's you know yeah. it just kind of goes against what what you would expect you know i saw yeah, I somebody it. tweet too that they saw like in the world building, like the world itself, they saw all of the evidence of Arcane, but everything else was absent of it. Um, to where kind of the the way the environments were designed and and the way that you could find information or lore was very Arcane like, and they recognized that, but everything else just dampened the experience for them. Kind of, I, I kind of see where they're coming from with it, but I think there is a part of the, the feeling of the map is very dead. 
you know, it's very quiet. It's very open. A lot. You well, know, you're trying to be vampires. Of course, it's going to be dead. Of course, or they're dead. Yes. Or Thank you. Oh my say. God. <laughs> yes. Uh, reflections don't work, probably for canon reasons. Uh, but <laughs> no, <there's... laughs> that's the way you get away with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, there is a lot of just empty running around in the game. Like truly, just you know, I have to get from point yeah. A to point B, and the quickest way is a straight line. And there's nothing interesting between me and B. You know, it's just runs. It's kind of like get that there. other game you played this year, or spoken. Forspoken was better, easily better. Easy, easy, easily better. I'm not going to play the Forspoken DLC, but it was better than Redfall for sure. I mean, this this just seems like a game that they knew wasn't going to hit. They've known for a while wasn't going to hit. You know, they have this this internal um, this internal set that like every quarter we're going to release a big game. And this was the big game, and it it more feels like a, it's a it's a sending it out kill fee kind of thing. Yeah, like just we're gonna put it out. We know it's not gonna do good. We're gonna move on to the next thing, uh, with the next thing being Starfield. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, you look at the release windows around it too, right? Like Star Wars a week before, Zelda a week after, right? It's definitely like a, you can easily miss this game, and you'll probably be fine. It, yeah, it's it's poised in such a position that it is going to be so quickly forgotten. Mm -hmm. I think, like especially, you know, from when the podcast comes out, we've got four days until Tears of the Kingdom, um, which looks fucking incredible. Mm. Um, that I just think that you know people people are going to move on. We are not going to be talking or thinking much about Redfall in two weeks. We'll see, you know, at, at the Xbox event, they'll do their big sizzle reel and they'll put like a second and a half of Redfall and everyone will go, yeah, I remember that game. And then like, that's it. <laughs> I mean, it's literally Star Wars, Redfall, uh, Zelda, Diablo, Final Fantasy 16. Like it just, Fighter. it's, it's mm -hmm. buried at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I do kind of want to zoom out on a bit here with the Xbox stuff, though, is <clears throat> there was a big debate, I would say, or a little bit of a discussion point on the Internet for the week, right, of like, sure, Xbox for years now has had the, the Game Pass trump card, right? Mm -hmm. But we're seeing more and more of these first party games maybe not quite hit the mark for Xbox. Do we feel that there's a point where there's too many blemishes on the record and maybe Game Pass just doesn't quite feel worth it? Or do we feel like that's kind of a, a apples and oranges kind of situation here? I think the, I, think, the, the, I the, think the value of Games Pass isn't just the first party titles. Honestly, I mean, I would argue that's not even part of my calculation of why I keep my Game Pass subscription going. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's that's definitely it's a huge it's a huge PR point, a huge sell point to be like our games day one. This is where you can play them and you can play them anywhere. Um, but, you yeah, know, I, I agree that it's not, you know, and it, it might just be because they have been having like a slew of misses with their first party titles. Um, I guess Hi-Fi Rush was great, um, you know, to just be like, hey, here's this cool game. Everyone was like, wow, this game is so cool. And then it's like, you can be playing it right now. Go, mm -hmm. go download it. And like, mm -hmm. that's that's a cool, that's a hype thing to be able to do. Um, and yeah, like if they had been consistently nailing it, I think if, if the first party games had been going well, it would be a huge part of the messaging. Like if Halo had gone great, if Redfall had become good, um, if, you know, people were like Halo super Legend. into Age of Empires, um, like if all of those things had like landed and landed strong, then I think that the first party aspect would be a much larger part of the discussion, but it, them not being strong. I think that it's not that that's like a negative to game pass. Cause I mean, you're still getting a game like yeah. at the end of the day, you know, it's not like, Oh, we released another bad game. I guess someone has to come to your house and, you know, hit you with a baseball bat. Like there's no loss on the consumer side. Right. Um, for, for the game, not landing. Mm -hmm. So I think it just it becomes less of the conversation, and instead I'm looking at, oh, Ravenlock, and in six months, um, you know, uh, Jedi Survivor will be added to it, and like that's going to be cool, and right. 
Yeah. And Starfield will be there. Probably riddled with bugs. Let's be fair. It's a Bethesda. That's not even a sl I mean, slam on just, the stuff. That's like a Bethesda. It's just thing. Bethesda. It's built yeah. in, right? They're part it's of a feature. Engine. Yeah. They're part of the creation engine. Um, and I, I don't know. I think my take on it is Phil said something that I thought was very interesting in the interview where he is a proponent of like just because the studio is good at making this one thing doesn't mean they have to stick with making that one thing. Um, and he pointed to Grounded as an example with Obsidian and Tango Game works with Hi-Fi Rush, right? Like those are two very out of left field for both of those studios. No one was expecting Hi-Fi Rush from Tango and no one was expecting Grounded from uh, Obsidian. And in the same mm -hmm. way here, maybe people weren't quite expecting what Redfall is from Arcane. And this was unfortunately a miss. Hi-Fi Rush was a hit. Grounded was a slow, eventual hit, from my understanding. People are liking Grounded after 1.0. Yeah. Um, but at first, you know, it's kind of like, oh, that's neat, but whatever, right? So I think Game Pass is just, like, we've, we've said for years now that Game Pass is a great place to find, like, the smaller experimental stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's in a philosophy that's kind of bleeding into the first-party studios as well. So right now, yeah, Redfall, kind of a pretty bad hit. Maybe in a year or two from now, we'll see a Redfall 2.0 that is decent or worth playing i don't know if that's something that appeals to many people right now but i don't think that's really the point i think the point is microsoft is willing to let their studios do weird shit or new stuff which is exciting on the face it may not be exciting in execution but if arcane sticks around and they create another new thing whether that's a dishonored three or something totally weird like a katamari damacy kind of game you know, I'm I'm on board to see what they want to try to do, you know, and Game Pass is an easy, accessible way for players to not really lose that much money on trying out a new thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a shame that Redfall kind of ended up the way it is. I think part of it was just maybe a messaging problem, too. I think they were trying to bank on, like, arcane strengths without truly divorcing it from, like, it's a, it's a different thing. It's its own thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah, it's like, oh, you guys love this company. This is a great company. It's like, yeah, but this is nothing that they've ever done before. Like, this is right. so far removed from what we're we know from them. So, like, it using their reputation and then simultaneously having an interview where you say, well, we're trying not to bank on their reputation, or like, you know, we're trying not to to force them to do the thing that they've always been known to do pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's very weird. Yeah, like, like you gotta you gotta be all in on that strategy, right? Like when when they mm -hmm. were when they revealed Hi-Fi Rush, you know, it was very jokingly like from the creators of Evil Within. No, seriously, right? It's yeah, like, yeah. Like obviously, you know where they're from, but they're not. This isn't an Evil Within sequel or anything like that. Uh, our last bit of news today: Nintendo, they love love their lawyers throwing out those DMCA's. Uh, the most recent one being a bunch of DMCA's at GitHub one of which took down uh, Lockpick, which is software that you can use to kind of download your Switch game's keys to be able to play them on an emulator, presumably on PC, most likely. Um, and now that software is DMCA taken down. Yeah, this is, I mean, Nintendo and emulators are a, a Tango partner that have been dancing for decades. Yeah. Um, yeah between how, how litigious they are with DMCA takedowns on ROM sites. Um, you know, and there's always, there's always something to be said for emulators and their illegal uses and also game preservation. Um, you know, so many games, you know, especially with the shutdown of the Wii shop and the Wii U eStore and the 3DS eStore that there is a shit ton of software out there that there is zero way to access it legally. Um, mm -hmm. But I think for for this, the way that the way that the piracy check works from my understanding is that like the game will check to see like, hey, do you have an up to date version of these keys that everyone's Nintendo Switch has these keys? It's what allows you to play and like get through that piracy filter, um, that piracy check. Um, and by DMCAing this tool, what it will effectively do will be remove someone with a modded Switch's ability to 
download the keys from their own switch to which immediately the world of piracy is like well they're they're Nintendo, their switch keys from my nintendo switch why shouldn't i have access to them and it's like well probably like the fact that those then get shared and it allows for anyone to play any game online mm-hmm. um this is especially relevant as you know we know that tears of the kingdom has broken street date yep and mm-hmm. is now leaked. yeah available and this is the same thing that has happened for every recent pokemon release um was it wasn't there a story around metroid dread like after it launched everyone was like oh but you can play it in 4k 60 fps on pc if yeah you... there was yeah yeah, yeah that was I think kotaku I or somebody posted an article that's like here's how to do it and everybody's like guys can you not mm-hmm. yeah it was like the the best place to play metroid dread is on your pc it was something along those lines which is like i mean you're not wrong that like technically um that's going to be the strongest place but also the games the game's been out for 24 hours guys like cool it Mm -hmm. yeah um so you know tech this is like this all follows back to this interesting thing that technically emulators are legal but it's once you have the ip that is not yours i.e nintendo's ip in forms of like roms or isos or um I don't even know what Switch emulation uses. I assume it would just be ISOs as image files. Um, but, you know, it's... it's the, the restricting of the keys is probably the most savvy way that Nintendo can stop it occurring. Yeah. Um, so this may actually be a pretty solid win for Nintendo. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I mean, they've always been in the market of doing this right like they i i don't know if nintendo is necessarily anti-preservation because that's that's the you know the nicer word for it right is preservation which i don't mean to make it sound like you know that's a bad thing like preservation is important um but it's like a fine line right are you emulating are you pirating are you preservationing it's kind of all three wrapped into one weird bundle you know Mm -hmm. um and unfortunately nintendo is trying to get rid of the pirates which makes sense from a business perspective but it's also hurting the preservationists which is unfortunate from like a culture perspective you know yeah because there will be there will be a shit ton of nintendo games that will just be disappeared off the internet um and i mean this is an issue across all games and especially we brought up earlier as libraries move to being digital um you know that's going to be harder and harder uh to to have that preservation or even games that we're seeing that like hey here's the disc of the game but the disc won't function unless you get a separate 100 gigabyte download right Um, yeah i mean at least nintendo is doing a great job of preservation on their own right cataloging everything on their nintendo switch online system service that you can just play for a nominal fee and all it's the like, games are there. It's also like, you know, a large part of what has like somewhat reduced piracy of like music and movies and TV shows is its availability. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm sure for a lot of people, you know, as opposed to pirating and emulating Pokemon Emerald or Black and White, Black and White 2, which now retail for like 70 bucks. Um, and that's if you get like a crap quality one, that if they just put it up on the fucking service, just yeah. let people, just let people, let people give you money for the things that they want to play Nintendo, please. Mm-hmm. Like, I bet you if there was a virtual console on Switch where all you have to do, like, it's just you can buy Pokemon Black or White for 20 bucks people would buy the shit out of that yeah and we already know that that like the the nintendo switch online apps are just like emulation wrappers and that you can you can put in a pokemon game and it will just work zero tweaks you put in the rom file and it will work and multiplayer and online works um but yeah but i mean definitely dmcaing this lockpick tool for their current console um i think that they've they've got to be feeling pretty happy with themselves um yeah you know i hope that it gets to like dmcas and like 
stopping it. I really hope that they don't overstep and impose some incredible fine um, for the rest of the life of the creator of this tool. It's that's, not Gary Bowser. Yeah, because that's just fucking weird. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It definitely feels like Excessive. it's stepped over a line. Yeah, I think yeah. that Nintendo takes trademark law almost too seriously sometimes <laughs> like with a trademark legally you're supposed to technically go after anything that infringes on your trademark mm -hmm. but right. a lot of other companies are pretty fast and loose about it especially if it is something that kind of benefits their community at large they can you can kind of hand wave that for the most part legally um but nintendo is just very black and white about it and mm -hmm. i think that yeah, especially in that case that stretch just brought up oh my gosh um like may take it a little too far like i understand imposing a fine for trademark infringement like that's fairly normal but taking someone's earnings for life is to me taking it a step too far because then you're you know they're you know bankruptcy and st stuff like that will come into play with with fines but taking 30 percent of someone's earnings for the rest of their life impacts their life in such a significant way yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty. This is probably just like swift retaliation for the uh, Tears of the Kingdom leaks, for sure. I feel like that's oh yeah, a big they're driver. They're trying levels. to look strong. Yeah, mm -hmm. which I mean, it makes sense. Like Tears of the Kingdom is the next big thing for the Switch. Like, yeah. like truly home run potential levels of big, right? So I can see why they're very protective of it. Uh, let's shift over and talk about some games. Stretch, you've been playing Ravenlock, which comes out on Game Pass, right? Yeah, no, it's it's out on Game Pass. It came out earlier, well, it came out last week. Nice. Um, it's by the developers Coco Cucumber. That um, they're like, I found that they're a smaller studio, definitely, but the people who enjoy their stuff really enjoy their stuff. Um, they've got a really awesome art aesthetic with with this game, with their last game, Echo Generation, and the game prior to that, that they've kind of bundled them as their voxel trilogy. But it's like very high quality voxels. Um, so it's uh, it's weird. It's like, I want to say it's like 3D pixelated characters, but it's not like an 8-bit pixelated character. It's like a 32-bit pixelated character kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's good definition. Um, but yeah, Ravenlock is just like, it's a fun, very short, very sweet adventure. Um, it took me like five and a half hours to beat the first time, um, where you are a character who has just moved to, uh, this new house, you know, out in the middle of middle of nowhere, rural town gets pulled through a mirror into a wonderland esque, um, esque situation complete with talking rabbits and a, you know, red queen who has an army of card like symbolism underneath mm -hmm. her and stuff and you just kind of you have to go around you you know clear a whole bunch of side quests the game did such a good job with my like ooh a piece of candy desire um that like you land in the world and it's like oh the queen's there and it's like here's your quest get to the queen and it's like oh she's locked behind this door here's another quest get the three keys for the door and then like every single person you talk to gives you more and more quest lines. Um, so you'll get like 15, 20 minutes into the game and you'll have seven or eight quests to complete. Um, you know, each of them having like their big check boxes underneath, uh, which I love. I'm such a, I'm such like an Uwe piece of candy gamer. <laughs> right. Um, but what's really neat is how all of them like layer into them as well. You know, it's kind of like you're shuffling a deck and like, okay, completing this objective on this quest will give you this item that you can then go into this quest and do that part and this, that, everything. And it just all comes together to be this really fun, really neat little story. Um, the combat is bland. Um, wow. It is um, for, for an, you know, action RPG uh, there is, you know, you have your regular attack button, and then as you play, each shoulder button gets a different, like, magic spell. But, you know, nine times out of ten, any enemy that you're fighting, just by repeatedly mashing the attack button, you stun lock all of them. Um, oh. So it's, like, it's not even a thing to worry about. Um, 
that are you there can... any like bosses or something that like yeah spice it up a bit yeah there are bosses and they definitely you know they they don't get stun locked to the same extent um but you know with with how basic the combat is and you know it really felt like you know mash as fast as you can deal as much damage um you'll always have like health potions and stuff mm -hmm. uh so you just you you know press x to win um very much gameplay wise but it's really in the story and the sense of adventure that i had a lot of fun with um and also going in between in between finishing resident evil 4 and then planning on getting back into ragnarok to finally finish playing ragnarok it was just such a nice little um palette cleanser um cute short five-hour adventure mm -hmm. game looks beautiful runs great the the audio is really charming um and just like a quick little experience and that's kind of i definitely think on game pass is where it will find its like sweet spot um as i've seen some people play it and be like oh wow that was so fast like i 100 percent completed the game in seven hours and it's like yeah you know that's that's there can be room for the short experiences <laughs> oh, not for everything sure. needs to be a 60 hour jrpg um you know as i look forward to friday when i get my my hands on tears of the kingdom and i become a hermit shell of myself as i travel around hyrule on end mm -hmm. literally the 300 hour rpg of the year yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and like yeah. i in the original game i got all of the shrines i got at least 600 of the karok seeds like it's gonna be bad. It was nice knowing you, Stretch. Uh, so yeah. the last you'll hear of him, last we'll see him. Uh, no, but then again in July, yeah, he emerges We're be from recording the cave. next weekend, and I'm gonna have like sunken Attack on Titan eyes. <laughs> hey guys, oh, yeah. it's a really good game. <laughs> you can only talk in the the Korok language. <laughs> but that's Ravenlock. You can play it on Game Pass. Seems like a fun little experience. Great for achievement hunters. Seems like um, yeah, very yeah. easy thousand point. Yep, something I will never it's understand. Not on Steam hey, yet though. You do you? Um, so I've been kind of no lifing Jedi Survivor. I finished it. Rhett, you've also finished the game. Mm -hmm. Um, we won't we won't talk spoilers yet. Uh, but I think I like Star Wars now. Um. <laughs> I think I think I'm I'm like in general or I I like this <laughs> at least uh, I I don't know about if if it's all of Star Wars quite yet but it's definitely a stronger Star Wars story than I've come to expect from Star Wars uh I don't know maybe right you feel differently because you've seen more Star Wars than I have um I think the characterization of it of the, of the characters are pretty strong much better than I expected, but still not the best, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, from a, a character world-building perspective, for sure, I think yeah. the the Jedi series is very strong. Um, you know, a lot of, of Star Wars games are rehashing the same stuff we've already seen with, you know, uh, the fall of the Republic, the Clone Wars, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think Force Unleashed is probably one of the more unique ones story-wise um and then you know you've got jedi academy and a lot of the others i think we're working on a feature going through all of the star wars games and uh there's a lot um yeah, there's like over a hundred star wars games yeah there's a lot and i think that what jedi survivor does is really good in the kind of character building that makes you really connect with the characters too um, and we can t probably talk more spoilers in a little bit, but I think that I have, I, you grow an attachment to a lot of the characters for sure. Um, mm -hmm. you know, having Marin come back is awesome. Um, seeing Seer again and then meeting some of these newer characters is really, really cool. Um, and they do such a great job when it comes to the force echoes in telling some of those stories so you know you're wandering around the cantina or whatever and you hit a force echo and it's turgle's story mm -hmm. just of him crying and of him crying yeah like <laughs> it's phenomenal the world building they use uh the additional collectibles to kind of flesh things out even more 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it, it adds to like, for me, a lot of collectibles in games are filler, but you know, you may fall into a mine and find a body with mm. a force echo on it. And you kind of get the backstory of how that body got there. Um, mm. And I think that that's such a, a good way to fill out the world um, in very short, like three to five second clips. Yeah, um, they're, they're basically like the Bioshock audio logs, just not as long. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're like three to seven seconds at the most. Mm-hmm. Um, all voice acted so you can kind of keep doing what you're doing without having to sit there and read it right um and i think that that's a really strong thing that that they've done for the for the world building Mm -hmm. yeah i i can't say i'm as attached to the collectibles i know you went through a lot of them partially for guide reasons right um for me it just kind of got to a point where i cussed like all of the all or most of the like the exploration options are just customization like do you want kyle to have a mullet or not um so you know it's just kind of up to you if that's something you really care about for me like i kind of landed on a costume i liked and i was like all right whatever this works for me so i didn't care about it as much uh to explore around and the echoes are interesting but to me not enough where i'm like i gotta get them all personally um yeah uh, but I do like that as you progress through the game, they do give you, if you explore certain spaces, they give you like, oh, now all the treasure chests show up on your hollow map and all the echoes show up on your hollow map. So if you are one of those completionist type people, you know, it's the, the game makes it pretty accessible to do it for the most part. They also don't force you to find every chest, which is nice. The only the only collectible that you basically have to. Well, there's two. One is the Priorite shards and there's 100 of them on Kobo. And then there are the seeds um, so that you can fully grow the garden. Mm -hmm. Um, But beyond that, like it's it's pretty. Pretty freeform collectible like set dressing cherry on top kind of stuff. If you want to dive in, you can, but there's no force. Yeah. Did you boot it up at all on um, on Epic or no? I've not had a chance to boot it up yet. Gotcha. Um, Because I I was curious about your take on the combat, but yeah uh i don't know i i kind of feel the combat is it's it's better than the first game for sure yes um i I played it on the second to hardest difficulty and i think there were still there were some encounters that were like this kind of feels like you're just gonna get stun locked every time because of how many enemies there are and how many like the big boys that they throw at you sometimes um so that gets a little bit annoying and frustrating to deal with uh i will say but otherwise i think it feels pretty good, like swinging that lightsaber around, however you do it, whether it's, you know, cross guard stance, dual wielding, blaster, whatever it is, right? feels pretty good. Did you do all of the force tears? I don't know. if there, Is there an achievement that pops up if you do all of them? Yes, but there, no. some of them are fucking hard. Yes, like, like there's one uh, where they the throw... The two Rancors mm-hmm. on Coruscant is brutal um, yeah. because you're fighting one and you also have to watch for the other one which if he happens to grab you he eats you and one you start kill. over um and then there's the return of agdo bagdo from the first mm. game where you fight two of them and they can just grab you with their tongue from across the arena yeah and those were the most frustrating part of that achievement was mm. taking those two down and in the end i cheesed it um i like it times you uh, 15 minutes because I was just like doing everything I could to avoid them grabbing me. Mm. Um, but yeah. Slow yeah no, the, those two really did suck. I was not a fan of either of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think let's go into spoilers. Uh, so this is your warning now, listener. If you haven't finished Jedi Survivor, pause this, go, go finish it. You know, you're probably not that far away from the end, right? And uh, come back here. And I guess maybe, yeah. maybe as we like lean into spoilers, like this isn't something specifically for Survivor, but for the greater narrative of like the Star Wars universe. Like I've I've finally been sitting down and catching up with um, Mandalorian season three and stuff, and I've seen some interesting discourse online on like the state of the Jedi and Order sixty six, and how so many. Star Wars narratives are like 
well, here's another slight survivor from Order 66. Here's another survivor from Order 66 yeah. and another and another. And it's kind of come out to be that like a Jedi surviving Order 66 seemed like it was a very big thing. Like, oh, there's there's still Jedi around like Obi-Wan survived. Like, it, like that's huge. You know, Obi-Wan survived, but now it's like, well, Ahsoka survived. <laughs> uh, there's all of the the members of um who are the who are the bad guys in the obi-wan show um the, Darth, Darth the, Vader? like the the, oh, the inquisitors yeah the inquisitors that were all like younglings or jedis that got turned bad and we've got cal and you know cal's mates and it just seems to be that like like yeah you know it's not like there's millions of jedi out there but it seems like a lot of the stories keep having there being like, oh, here's another survivor. Here's another survivor. What do you guys think that that does to the like initial impact of Order 66 with so many survivors? I mean, I think like there were so many Jedi, um, like a significant number, even in the High Republic, like, um, I was reading one of the books where something happens in hyperspace that sends shards of a ship across an entire solar system and causes like catastrophe on these planets, like ab absolute, you know, Armageddon type stuff. And they send like 70 Jedi in their ships to, to combat this whole thing. And so there's just, there's so many, it's not surprising that they slip through the gaps. It is an easy story element. If, yeah. if we're being honest, but I think that it also, as long as they don't overdo it and we're not like, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one, like 75 times, like it's, it's still believable at the moment. I mean, yeah, it, the galaxy is a big place, you know, it's, it's pretty big, kind of hard to get around. So I get, you know, it totally makes sense to me. And I think Star well, Wars also is kind of in that, um, it's in that corner of the, the there are some stories out there that i know people like that don't start the jedi the problem is most of star wars stories start the jedi so it's like if you're going to kill all the jedi you're killing star wars like sorry to yep. say i know that there are a lot of people out there who say like give us more stories without jedi like sucks to suck you're only getting jedi stories for the most part i think that's just what <laughs> star wars is um so it's, it's, a it's i mean it's a huge plot point you go through the x-wing yeah. series where you're following rogue squadron after the destruction of the second death star and one of the main characters you follow, you get like four books in and oh shit, he's force sensitive. Mm -hmm. And then that become he becomes part of, you know, Luke's new academy and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. This is all no longer canon. But right. um, I thought that that well, was one of the strongest stories now, right? Yep. Yeah, it's called Legends. Legends. Yeah. I mean, look at look at Kyle Katarn from, I think, like Dark Forces, mm -hmm. right? He was just a like, I don't remember, Bounty Hunter. It was, it was like a Doom clone, right? The game was just a shooter. Yeah. And then halfway through, it's like, oh, he's force sensitive. And you get the Jedi, you get the star, la the laser sword, right? It's like, mm -hmm. okay, it doesn't matter anymore. Everyone's a Jedi. That's the only thing that's interesting in Star Wars. That's, that's what Star Wars has been pushing for decades, right? So, of course, the Jedi are going to survive, right? They have to uh, at the end yeah. of the day because they become, it, it's a never ending cycle. It, you look at each era, the Jedi are involved in some way, shape, or form, whether it's mm -hmm. High Republic, Fall of the, you know, Fall of the Republic the new order so on and so forth um it'd be like having a dragon ball show without a saiyan like i'm sorry that's just not gonna work <laughs> i think in the same way with star wars it's hard to do star wars without something about jedi they, they did try to release that video game and as far as i can tell people have not been enjoying it. the breakers yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly I, I think that's just kind of where star wars is whether that's fortunate or unfortunate i think is up to the person yeah. um but i will say with bringing it back to jedi survivor um survive is the big the big word of the game if you played a drinking game where you take a shot every time someone says survive survivors surviving in a cutscene, you are dead by the end yeah. of the game like true yeah. i'm pretty sure at least once a cutscene survive comes up you know it's kind of crazy yeah i mean to get into spoilers to give another heads up to people who continue listening um we found another survivor like halfway through the yeah. game. We found two survivors yeah. throughout the game. 
Yeah. So I, yeah, I mean, that's why I was bringing it up, and especially like you know, as as you know, I'm I'm rewatching Mandalorian, and I knew that there was at least one. That's funny that there's two in almost uh, in th Survivor. Pot potentially three. It's like two and a half, kind of. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is is um, Torgal a, a Jedi wielder? I fucking wish, man. I Bro, what if he was a, what if we what if we jar jarred him and he was a Sith? Yeah. Man, <laughs> sign me the fuck up. Yeah. Dark Big Rivet. Turn. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um okay, yeah. So let's let's get into the first one you find in the story. Well, no, that's not fair. The first one that's revealed to be a Jedi, Dagan, Dagan, Dagan Gera. Dagan Gera. Yeah, yeah. 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 Dog and Gera, who seems to be the big bad of the game for part of it, he's the one, he's a High Republic Jedi who's been put in, in a sleep tank. chamber. Yeah, back yeah, to, he's been, sure. Because, like, Bacta will keep you, it's, the way they use Bacta as, like, a story thing is is always interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I did not, there, in no book have they ever used it to, like, basically cryogenically freeze someone. But Wait, sorry, what is Bacta? Bakta is it's not jizz. Um, it, it's uh it's like this plant that's harvested on I don't remember the name of the planet. It's in the first Knights of the Old Republic that uh is distilled into kind of a, a liquid that you can suspend people in and it heals them. Um, okay. So like you know that's what Luke was in in uh Empire. That was mm. a Bacta tank. Oh, okay. um, that he's floating in yeah and so you find Dagon in that and he's been there for like 200 years or something um, from the high republic from the high republic hadn't aged at all and i did not realize that was possible with a back to tank but well, there we go i guess um i guess the the core um macguffin of the story is you want to get the tantalor which I, I don't know for sure if it's introduced in this game, like if, if there has been other mentions of Tantalor in like the tomes or whatever. Okay, so this is the first introduction of it. Um, so Tantalor is this planet hidden behind an abyss that is hard to get to. It's kind of like a Bermuda Triangle situation, like anyone who tries to fly through it dies. But mm. that also means it's hard to find, like the Empire can't find it. So Dog and Gera and his mentor slash partner, Centauri Kree, right? Um, God, Jedi names are so dumb. So they uh, they find Tantalor, they want to make it like a home base, and they do make a temple there. Um, but then I think the Jedi Order wants to give it up, right, to the Empire or something along those lines. They uh, didn't They didn't want to maintain it or something along those yeah, lines. They didn't want to defend uh, it, right? Yeah. yeah. So And then that made Dagon very mad, because he was like, this is our future, uh, and he basically goes rogue, and Centauri cuts off his arm, puts him in the chamber, makes him grounds him basically in the chamber, makes him think about what he's done. And then when he comes out of it, when you free him, he goes, Sith? Is that what it means when they go red? Right? Mm -hmm. He basically turns evil. Turns um, to the dark side. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, oh, this manhunt, like, you know, one track mind mission to get to Tantalor again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, in the main early story element too is the Bedlam Raiders and Ravis specifically, um, where it turns out that Ravis has been there for Dag and Gera the whole time. Um, and, and Ravis is interesting too in, in kind of what he is and how he is. Like, obviously, he's extremely old, um, extremely resilient to damage. And so you find out that he's working with Dag and Gera to get him to free him essentially like mm -hmm. because he has uh, it's not like a blood oath like uh Wookiees have but he's like very into loyalty right um, and so that I, was that was one of the big plot elements too yeah I did think Dagon was pretty cool in that even though he only had one arm the way he uses the force is basically like he has an arm back which is I thought that was pretty fucking cool to see yeah. you know because he like dual wields the saber and all that um but yeah, you eventually kill Dagon, and then it's revealed that the true big bad is your best friend, Bo the good, the good old bounty I did hunter. not see that one coming. Um, I, I saw the, the heel turn coming, because to me, it's like, he seems very planted. He feels very like, yep, he's just the new part of the crew, and you trust him immediately. Um, I was not expecting the force push, and then he pulls out the saber. 
that yeah was what i was not expecting yeah that threw me for a loop and i was like well shit okay um and that he's been working with the imperial the whole time ever since he was captured or whatever mm -hmm. um very interesting yeah. in terms of, you know, uh, another way to kind of, I don't know, catalyze Cal as like a person, mm -hmm. um, just another betrayal, you know, where early on in, in Fallen Order, you're very slow to trust. Yeah. And now you trust and that trust gets betrayed and you lose your mentor and your mentor's mentor um all because of one person yeah yeah because the uh, bode kills well he kills eno cordova right yeah but he but, called vader in and right ultimately that got her killed yeah because there was that cool bit where you play a seer for a bit and you actually fight vader and it you basically almost kill him kind of mm -hmm. he seems pretty beaten down but I mean, name a Star Wars game where that happens. You know, I feel like didn't that happen oh, with Force Awakens too, right? Like, yeah, or Force Unleashed too. Um, but I mean, it, I think it was executed pretty interestingly here. And with Bode, what I liked is that his motivations felt very Sony first party game. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he wants a dad. To yeah, he's a mad dad who wants to protect his daughter, right? Which like. You know, I think parenthood is an easy kind of story motivator, but it's interesting to use it from a villain's perspective, right? Because mm -hmm. basically the crux is Cal wants to use Tantalor as a base to fight the Empire. Like he wants to build forces on Tantalor to fight the Empire. While Bode has been wanting to use Tantalor as a safe, like humble sanctuary away, not like a, a military base kind of energy. So that's where the divide comes in. And that's why he betrays Cal, because he wants to keep Tantalor safe for his daughter, which it's one of those decisions that makes sense at the first second. And then the more you think about it, the more it's like, how are you going to get food, man? Um, yeah. So and, she, and when you get there, too, she's also like miserable. She's like, yeah. it's it's so empty. Mm -hmm. um, and it was I take a lot. I will say I take a lot of issue with the ending um, mm. in that. You know, Cal, Cal is Cal. He doesn't want to kill Bode, but Bode forces him. Right. And then you essentially adopt his daughter, and that that's the end of the game. And it's like you kill her dad. Okay, and now so like her dad. we just yeeted this dude, and his daughter's like completely chill with it. Very strange. And how old is the daughter? Do, she's probably like, like five, six, seven. Okay. So somewhere between five and, and ten, I, I would guess. Um, and, you know, she quickly become, you know, Marin and Cal are now her space dad and mom. Um, mm -hmm. But it just felt like it ended very abruptly. Like we did all of this stuff for Tantalor to get to Tantalor. And then it's just like, yeah, let's bumble around the galaxy now. Um, yeah. And if you're jumping from planet to planet, you get interactions between Marin and Cal and uh, Grease and his daughter, but really nothing past that in terms of like what's coming. So maybe the third one is where they actually do the Tantalor stuff. But I was hoping there would be some kind of like cutoff of where it's like, here's what's next. Mm -hmm. um, and it just felt very abrupt in terms of, okay, we killed Bode, it's game's done. Great work. Yeah, I, I agree that it feels abrupt. And I also, I, I didn't believe the sudden transition from being Bode's daughter to now Cal's stepdaughter yeah. energy, right? Um, but I also kind of chalk that up to Star Wars writing. I've always felt Star Wars writing, especially for characters, can be a little hollow and, you know, just like, yeah. that's what it is on the face. You like it or you don't, right? Um, so I did feel that was a misstep. And as far as where the game has been up to this point, where all the characters do feel pretty like they're given moments and time to flesh things out. Like I think the, the Cal and Marin romance reblossoming throughout the game, I thought that was done fairly well in an unbelievable way. Um, but this was definitely like a sudden, yep, you're my dad now, I guess. And I mean, she's not like <laughs> the happiest about it at first, but it's not like there's a moment. There's there really isn't a moment to give them time to process and talk about it for the viewer, you know? Yeah, yeah I was hoping there would have been more, more there 
to kind of build that relationship to where it became i don't want to say natural but like just believable mm -hmm. um it, it did awkward. feel very abrupt yeah mm -hmm. like all right we left tanalor she's cool with everything cal and marin had a chat with her about you know how to get past this kind of emotional damage right um and that was it like mm -hmm. i don't know and maybe it was because the kid you know, understood that like dad was a fucking dumbass and just kept going. But <laughs> um Cal's like, I don't want to kill you. And he's just and he goes at him again and Cal has to fucking double tap him. Um which was savage as fuck. Yeah. Um like, I was like he's just like pow pow I'm like oh shit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um yeah. I mean I, I think that speaks to what Cal has is becoming right i mean it, there's definitely i think they would have been hinting at it for most of the game that he's brushing up to the dark side right like that's what seer was going through in the first game um and there's a moment i remember this pretty clearly from the game where when you're chasing after bode right like after he first reveals that he's a traitor oh, yeah, your, your time slow like completely changes yeah well that yeah that happens when you're in the base but even like when you're entering so you you go to this frozen meteor thing meteor, like an asteroid where Nova there's a, an imperial base yeah nova garen so you go there and, I, and that was a point where i was like okay it's late in the night i'm gonna stop here so i went to the meditation point and rested and then i looked at my skills tree just to see what i could spend on and your skill tree or like the the clouds behind it are red now instead of blue and i was like mm -hmm. okay i'm gonna keep playing a little bit <laughs> i was like all right there's gonna be some dark side shit going on here um i wanted to see what that would be about and then I ran into a bug where BD wouldn't work. So I was like, okay, fine, whatever, I'm done. Because it is still, there's still a few bugs throughout the game. I think I crashed yeah. like three or four times. Um, but yeah, you do get a little bit of dark side in this. Now it's just that when you go into your your devil trigger mode, your super mode, whatever you want to call it, um, you just get stronger because you're tapping into the dark side. Um, I expect if there is a third game in this, which feels like it's, probably coming it does feel very sequel baity uh dark side is gonna be a skill tree or something about it you know which is pretty classic for a lot of star wars games too usually you can try kind of choose light side dark side um, mm -hmm. watch it be uh the the daughter is all grown up cal went missing decades ago and there's now an evil new masked sith and oh surprise it's cal <laughs> <laughs> yes it's darth bingus <laughs> he's yeah. even got like the mullet built into his like helmet and cowl <laughs> I love it. that would be so good or i mean on... poncho yeah i mean throughout the game i was honestly expecting them to set up a thing where they fuck off to tantalor and then in some future star wars something like post episode nine it's like elder cal with an army of jedi and they would somehow play into some new story. But I mean, I guess that's still possible, right? Like the game ends in a way where like Tantalor is their new base. Which is kind of what I thought was going to happen was like that was where it would end to where, you know, they're there and they're starting to set things up. It's not like finished, it's but it's early stages of, you know, all right, we're here. We've got some of our friends and people here. And then it just kind of pans off to credits and that was kind of what I was expecting the payoff to be in terms of there's obviously going to be a sequel. Like there's no way you don't kind of follow this whole thing up, but to not really get the inclination of like what the next steps were, I think was, was what threw me the most. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, in terms of like, we, we know that the star Wars media you know empire there's like there's a lot of a lot of fire being put under kathleen kennedy to like get some more consistent some more good stuff out um and like we've got a movie coming for like the first jedi um we've also got the one about like the new jedi order that daisy ridley will be training so it would be very easy to throw uh to throw an elder cow cameo in there um i think it's just it's kind of weird that where cal is in the timeline is kind of 
not really where anything in the past is set and not really where anything in the like in the like present is set yeah so it's just a weird place for uh for those stories to be when you're yeah. kind of like mid peak of the empire for the most part like yeah you you be like this years um that you know they're they've kind of grown out into what the empire came to be they're, they're everywhere because this yeah. happened like his, cal's timeline is like around a new hope or like prior to a new hope right it, yeah, i think it would be before yeah it would be pre four yeah. if i remember yeah. and it's but probably it's around the like... same time as rebels okay for yeah, because there's just like that weird, like sixteen year window, where where that can occur, but yeah, I mean, I guess Rebels happens there, but nothing else is happening there. We've got everything happening with Mandalorian, Boba Fett, and stuff. Thirty, forty years in the future, um, but uh, not much else. <laughs> yeah, Boba Fett does show up in this game too, actually. Uh, it's, oh, he, he makes a little cameo. Mm -hmm. uh, that's so, kind of what yeah. Star Wars is, though, right? It's just a bunch of cameras. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is pre pre Sarlacc. Yeah. Well, you had yeah. Zeb in uh, uh, Mandalorian from Rebels too. Hmm. I love that. I love the cameo. I love that you'll talk about like, oh, I was on this frozen this frozen meteorite, and and Rut knows the name, or the Dagon was suspended in in goo for 200 years but based on his knowledge from this book and this book he's never heard of it be used this or that way but i got to stump him last week with the musical <laughs> stylings of jizz yeah. i was just like the it's the the encyclopedic knowledge but not knowing like the baseline like haha this is a funny fun fact <laughs> like you're, you're so deep into the facts yeah you're so yeah. deep into the iceberg you don't even know that there's a mariachi band on top of the iceberg yeah. <laughs> he's, he's beyond jizz <laughs> yeah but I'm all I of my computers after star destroyers so <laughs> I, it sounds like a really cool game i'm definitely looking forward to getting to it at some point when that will be, it might be when it hits Game Pass, in all honesty. <laughs> I, mean, I think maybe. you like the ex exploration and the puzzles a lot. Like okay. the, the, the Jedi is a chambers lot definitely were um, a highlight in terms of figuring out how to get to, from point A to point B. And only after I watched other people's YouTube videos did I realize I went a, I had accomplished them in a very different way than everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, you got to love so. when a game like opens up there's no like set right way to do it but they give you that chance to to like look at all of the tools and maybe abilities that you have or have not put into and and adjust your approach with that mm -hmm. yeah. to be fair we're all about to play another game with a bunch of jedi chambers and it's called tears of the kingdom because those were basically breath of the wild shrines yeah uh yeah. just through the lens of jedi um like they even kind of have similar like architecture <laughs> almost kind of kind of feels pretty and, weird and you go into them and beat up droids and pick up their light swords yeah so, yeah, so it's all the so same link is a jedi is what we're saying yes essentially i mean yeah when you when you when you first see him wake up at the shrine of resurrection at the start of breath of the wild and all of the bacta gets mm -hmm. emptied out of his uh his vat yeah yeah he comes it's out of the, the bacta thing. right hell mm -hmm. link even has like a weird robotic arm in this new game yes. yeah. <laughs> and he uses the force to fuse things together yeah no straight up he, he is he is a jedi yeah i guess the magnesis is almost kind of the force <laughs> yeah a little bit yeah mm -hmm. definitely yeah but i don't know overall like i've always been kind of lukewarm on star wars but this you know J jedi survivor i think was pretty good i'm, I'm kind of like very eager to see what the future of this Jedi franchise will do. I mean, if there is like a third game, like if they're planning to do something else, I would not be surprised, but I could also see them kind of leaving it at that. Cause right now it does have very potential. Like I kind of walked out of it the same feeling as like Thor love and thunder. If you know how that movie ends, it's definitely yeah. got a similar feel. Um, yeah. A so. lot of the times where you guys were talking about like, well, he's now, you killed the guy and then you've now adopted his daughter and i was like wow that's very similar to thor <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's definitely by disney mm -hmm. that's true 
I mean, honestly, I just want to see more of Cal and Marin. I, I like them together. They're a lot of fun. Yeah, agreed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So does that mean that the new Jedi has gotten away with like, or has gone away from like the celibacy stuff? Like, no. Technically, they weren't celibate. They just okay, what, what weren't were they supposed to like, right? married or have like deep attachments. So, so you could fuck. You just couldn't care about it. You had that's to kind be of, a fuck. That's kind of the the implied. <laughs> bit i've gotten over the years yeah so jet all jedi are fuck boys you <laughs> probably be a fuck boy to be a jedi yeah i mean there's I a lot be, of fuck I mean, boys yeah. yeah if you watch like rebels um or was it clone wars clone wars uh the tv mm. show obi-wan has a very close connection to the ruler of mandalore um mm-hmm. And he's like, had, and he literally says to her, like, had you said the word, I would have left the Jedi Order. Um, so there, there's a lot of that in Star Wars. I think that a lot of kind of implied type stuff. Mm. And here they, they don't quite imply as much as they just kind of, I mean, I guess they don't show anything explicit necessarily, but there's definitely just like full on like making out in the game. Oh, okay. they fucking. <laughs> <laughs> In some sandy ass cave in the middle of Jetta. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a Gross. sacred space. But yeah, that's Jedi Survivor. I mean, it's not bad. I, I wish the performance issues weren't as annoying because they definitely kind of plagued some of my time with it. But otherwise, you know, I think it's in play on it's PC. Played on PS5, but okay. still got a few crashes and like bugs that kind of made me have to restart the game. Um but otherwise, I think the story was, you know, fine. The ending may be a little polarizing for some people, but it has me very curious about what's next. And that, I think, is maybe a mark of a interesting story, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They did um, good. They did all right for Star Wars, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to watch any other Star Wars thing, though. Maybe Andor. I hear good things about it, but... Definitely watch Andor. Like it's different than any other Star Wars media. That's um, what I hear. Yeah, they only find one person who survived Order sixty six in Andor. Mm. <laughs> His uh, name it's Luke very Skywalker. like spy thriller, more so than anything else. Mm. Gotcha. I think that does it for this week's episode of the Tech Raptor Podcast. We hope you enjoyed. And if you did, please leave us a review on whatever platform you're listening on. And let us know down below, what was the most interesting thing from the uh, Phil Spencer interview that you latched onto? What's something that you, what's an insight that you saw that maybe we didn't see? We'd love to hear and read your thoughts, which you can post down on the YouTube comments down below. Or if you're on our site, you can check out the comments down there too. Um, if you want more news, reviews, features, etc. from us, we are always posting every day of the week at techraptor.net. But if you want more of this show, we'll be back next Monday, potentially with some Tears of the Kingdoms thoughts. It depends on how much time we get in that video game because it comes out on a Friday. We will see you then. Bye.